So let's go ahead and read. We're going to read Revelation chapter 7. We're going to read this whole chapter and then we're going to go back into d discussing it and breaking it down. Well, you know what? Before we do, before we move forward, let me, let me just bring up a couple of things here. I was going to go into this. So I had a conversation and it was with Robert. And I don't think Robert minds me saying this because I think that we can all get something out of this because it can be a teaching moment. Okay. So Robert and I were talking the other day and he made, he, he made a, a reference to the last teaching specifically where I was talking about the rapture taking place between seal six and seal seven. Right. And, and we covered all of that and what, and now we kind of moved through because we went through the seals and then what we did, if you'll remember correctly, was we compared that to Matthew 24 and the main emphasis of what I was desiring to accomplish in that teaching was to show the closeness of the, if I could say chronology, I'm not trying to use big words, but of the timing of events and how they correlate with one another between Matthew 24 and, and the seals, right? So seal one, two, three, four, five, and six have a correlating passage in Matthew 24, antichrist, wars, famines, uh, death, the martyrs, and then the sun turning dark and the moon not giving its light. All five of those first things occur in, simul in chronological order in Matthew 24 and in chronological order in seal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 6. Does, does that y'all follow me? You remember how we went through that and we kind of showed the two of them side by side. And so whenever when the, one of the points that Robert made was he said, look, man, I just I'm, I see what you're showing me as far as the verse that you're saying is the rapture. I'm just not I'm just not feeling like that is that much evidence to show that it's not a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, in other words, that that's enough evidence for me to believe that it's still not a pre. And that's fair. I mean, I want feedback like that, right? And so, but I, but I do want to point out a couple of things. Uh, you know, number one, one of the bigger pieces of information that I was trying to point out is how Matthew 24 so closely compares to the seals of Revelation and that we're getting somewhere whenever we're comparing those two together. So that's the bigger picture, right? And so I did, I asked him, I said, and, and he look, I asked him, I said, what are you, com what are you saying evidence compared to what? And his response was, well, evidence on the pre-tribulation scripture. And I said this, I said, but Robert, that's one of the points I've been trying to make. I don't see that. I, and I've been asking, have I not, anybody that has not heard me ask for four scriptures, let me know. Okay. And listen, so I'm asking again, and I'm going to call some people out. I'm, I'm going to call, I'm going to ask um, Jessica, because I feel like, I feel like there's certain people in this church that I know have studied the book of Revelation possibly more than others. So I'm going to ask Jessica, I'm going to ask Hannah, I'm going to ask Aaron, and I'm going to ask Bridget. And even Mike, if you want to throw your name into the hat, that's fine. And what I'm asking for is, and Naya, if you've studied it, and this, this is going down next week, pre-tribulation scriptures in the New Testament that show distinctly that there's a pre-tribulation rapture. You understand what I'm saying? Because I am going to, when we get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, show you a scripture that I believe specifically says it's not. And that's a letter written by the Apostle Paul, who is not talking in apocalyptic language, meaning symbolic language, but straight up, boom, boom, boom. And we're going to deal with that whenever we get to it. So what I'm asking is for scriptures like that and going back to the reference point to, to, to what Robert was saying. And Rob, I just want, I put this up here so that we could... Another thing that you said that you had questioned, and I thought it was a great question when you said, wouldn't have John known that that whether that was the rapture or not when he was in heaven. Right. And that and that was the question you asked. But I want and I want to say, because in other words, what he's saying is he's a Jew. He studied the Bible before he was he, he already knew about Jewish history. 
And I'm thinking, he didn't say all this, but I'm, this is what I'm thinking he was thinking. So why would he not have known what Daniel had already said? He probably did know what Daniel said, but can I tell you something? The book of Revelation is a whole new piece of information that wasn't there before. Yes, there's a lot of information in Revelation that correlates with Daniel. And when we move forward, we will see specific things like connected to the beast, where we know the language is almost exactly the same as Daniel. But, in, but when the revelation was given from God to Jesus through the angel to the servant John on the Isle of Patmos, it was a whole new element of information that helped tie loose ends together for God's people. And this is part of the what I wanted you to see here. In Revelation 1.19, this is what the Lord said, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And then in Revelation 4, 1, where he said, come up here and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that you got to remember what happened is, is that John was brought up in the spirit and he was brought up into the heavenly realm and he was given. And it seems like to me, I don't think that I'm stretching when I say this specific scenes that he was seeing and I do not believe that he knew all of these things in advance. And this is one example. He says that nobody was worthy to open the scroll. You remember that? And he began to weep. Okay. And then what happened? The elder came to him and said, why do you weep? The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed and he is worthy to open the scroll. John didn't know that. John didn't know what was going on and he was weeping. Okay. And so this is new information for him. And in addition, if you'll remember in Daniel, it talked about that some of that information was sealed up until the time of the end, meaning that all the understanding of these things were going to be slowly opened up as we got closer and closer to the end. But I do want to make one, one particular point that if we were going to compare that scripture that I gave y'all about what I was saying, I felt like was the rapture, a picture of the rapture last, the last time we came together. Y'all remember that, that we moved on to revelation seven. And I said, listen, this is what I believe to be the picture of the rapture. Now you may know this and you may not know this. And I'm not saying this in any negative way. I'm just saying, I'm telling you, I've been going to preach teach churches for a long time that we're teaching the pre-tribulation rapture. And what I have learned in those churches, didn't even realize it until I started studying for myself. This particular scripture right here is one of the main ones that they're using to describe the pre-tribulation rapture. Meaning whenever, let me go back to it. Revelation chapter four, verse one Again, I said it once, but let's say it again. After this, I looked, behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice, which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now I've explained this before, but that this is taught as though the John being brought up is the rapture and that this is the end of the church age. And that this is the rapture. And so when I was when I was showing you these two scriptures, what I was doing was I was comparing specifically that passage, Revelation 4, 1, and then going down to 4, 4, what John saw when he went to heaven. What did he see? Round about the throne were four and 20 seats, 24 seats. Upon the seats I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And so the way that it was taught, John is representative of the church. And when he gets up there, he is also with these 24 elders dressed in white robes. And that this is the raptured church. And that the 24 are representative of Old Testament and New Testament saints. Now I just ran across the scripture and I don't remember exactly where it was, but I was, it was in my Bible reading yesterday. So it was in Matthew. And Jesus told the disciples, he said, don't you know that you will judge the 12 tribes of Israel? So for me personally, I'm thinking that that's a good spot for this right here. 24 elders. I can't prove that this is who they, they are. But to me, 24 elders, the 12 apostles judging the 12 tribes of Israel, 
I do believe that this could be representative of the 12 tribes and the 12 disciples. I cannot prove it, but I don't believe that this is the raptured church. That's just my opinion. But that is what most pre-tribulational teachers and preachers teach. Now, I just wanted you to see the two. So what I was comparing when I brought you to Revelation 7, 9, and I, saw, and, and I showed you this. After this, a great multitude, which no man could number. Look, from every nation, kindred, people, tongue, stood before the throne, before the Lamb, and they also were clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now, Again, does this prove definitively the point that, no, absolutely not. But I'm just trying to show you what I was really trying to compare. So hopefully you see at least what I was trying to, to do and to say. Okay, so that was, and then, and then let's just go ahead and, and maybe we'll take another little step at it. So look, this is where I compared to this Matthew 24. Look, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And look, the revelation corresponding scripture, look, sun became black, moon became like blood, stars of heaven fell. You see there Matthew 24, 29. Now look, Matthew 24, 31, two verses later. Now he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Does, does that sound like the rapture to you? I mean, it does, it does to me. Okay. And, and so I, that's what I was trying. And then in this, and then the, the corresponding, the next scene in Revelation is in chapter 7, and we're about to break chapter 7 down, and that's where that multitude was in heaven from every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. And I just want to remind you, because we're not even going to talk about it again tonight, a whole chapter 7 is, a, is, a, is an interlude, or it's a, it's a chapter that's compressed between seal number 6. And seal number seven, which starts trumpet number one, which is in Revelation chapter eight. Does that make sense? This whole chapter that we're going to read tonight is occurring in between seal number six and seal number seven. In other words, we're getting a visual in heaven of what's going on between seal number six and seal number seven. Does that make sense? And seal number seven, just, just for purpose and thought we'll get to it probably the next time i teach is actually seal number seven is trumpet number one is that they, they concur at the same time okay all right so let's go ahead i think we should go ahead and try to try to read uh the chapter that we're going to read revelation chapter seven verse one and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now, really what that means right there is that God is saying, hold back the wrath. And, and once we get to trumpet number one, you'll see that what I'm telling you is right, because when the first trumpet is blown, that's exactly what happens is the trees in the sea are hurt. And so, so it's, listen, the angels are being held back from the wrath of God being poured out, all right? And it says, and I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now I'm going to skip through because I got a PowerPoint for this, but he just goes and he starts listing all the different tribes, okay? And we're going to go through and you'll be able to see all the ones that were listed, all right? And, and we're just for sake of time moving, moving through this. Joseph, and then the last one was Benjamin. Now, after this, after... He sees the 144,000 after the fact that they were sealed. After this, I beheld, and this is that multitude that we were just talking about, which I'm saying to me looks like the picture 
after the rapture has taken place and the visual that John sees. Okay, so, so we're going to read it again. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, you know. So really what's happening here is that the elder is asking John, I guess you could say a rhetorical question. He's almost really like, he's saying, where did they come from? John's acting like he doesn't know. And he's referring back to the elder. And he's saying, sir, surely you know, right? I said unto him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sunlight on them nor any heat. For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So, if... If this is a picture of the raptured saints, again, this is occurring kind of what I'm saying mid-trib, kind of sort of a little bit after mid-trib. And, and I will tell you that I believe that this would take place after the Antichrist has been revealed. And, I'm, and, I, and let me just say this, when I get to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that's where I'm going to show you that I believe that's exactly what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says. That the rapture will not take place until the Antichrist is revealed. I believe it's straight up. No monkeying around with it. No, no twisting it. It just straight up is telling us exactly that. That the rapture will take place after the Antichrist has been revealed. Revealed, And so what's happened is seal number five. Y'all remember what seal number five was? It was martyrs. It was souls that were under the altar. And they were crying, when will you avenge our blood? And they said, you must wait a moment, a season, until your other brothers that have also given their life. Nobody wants to preach it like this. <laughs> I can tell you right now, nobody wants to preach it like this. Why would you? No, it, it, because listen, the reality is, is that nobody wants to have to go through hard times. Nobody wants to have to face trial and tribulation. Nobody wants to have to be thrown into prison because you believe. Listen, y'all don't even watch Fox News anymore because I don't tell y'all don't watch Fox News. Well, guess what? I was kind of lying because I've been going to bed every now, almost every night for the last five nights and I turned it on for about 20 minutes till I get tired. You know what they had last night on Fox News. I think it was Tucker Carlson. I think it was Tucker. Tucker had some blonde headed lady that was a journalist. I think she was a Dutch journalist. He was showing video clips of hundreds, not thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of Europe protesting and screaming at the top of their lungs about no vaccine because there's vaccine mandates that are coming down and already in Europe they have a vaccine card that's a QR scanner and you cannot get into a grocery store unless you have your vaccine QR card and this blonde Dutch journalist lady straight up said the reason that they're in the streets and that they're doing this is because they know what's next Tucker they know what's next. This is the next step to this is, is telling hum, human beings that they will not be able to, to function or do any kind of business without this. And they know that if they don't stand now, it's just going to get worse. Have you seen that on the news anywhere besides that little clip that they showed? No, you haven't. And so the question is, why in the world is this being hidden from us? Now, are you trying to say that? that I'm not trying to say nothing other than what I saw on the TV. So what I'm trying to say is, is that I'm telling you right now, 
We're already in the midst of some bad times. Whether we recognize it or not, whether we see it or not, it's already way bad out there. And most of us know. But I'll be honest with you, we'd rather just, and I'm, and I'm kind of with you on this. I'd rather just get up early in the morning and just go back to work and just kind of forget that all this is going on. But it, we don't have that luxury anymore. We don't have that luxury anymore because the world around us is changing every day when we wake up. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. And so what I can tell you is this, is that if it is going to go down this way, <coughs> the same Jesus that got Paul through what Paul went through, that got Thomas through what, what he went through, that got Mark through what he went through, that got Ignatius, and, and not Ignatius, I'm sorry, but uh, Irenaeus and all of these other church fathers that gave their life for the gospels, the same Jesus that's going to, I never thought that I would actually see this. You understand? See the change on the landscape of the world the way that it's happening. I did, I wrote the book, I did all this study or whatever the case. Oh man, this is some really cool information that I learned. And then to see things begin to change before my very eyes. I never would have thought that I would have seen it, but I'm but I'm seeing it. And I and I think that most of you are are seeing it too. Alright? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna keep going through the scriptures and we're going to try to look at it from every angle that we can and we're going to try to be prepared for whatever it is that we will ever face amen whether it's popular or not amen all right so after these things after what things after the day of the lord after the sun became black after the moon became like blood and and people started to realize that the wrath of god was about to be poured out on them from the and they would hide themselves from the wrath of the lamb who shall be able to stand? And then after these things, verse 2 and 3. And I saw another angel ascending. I want you to notice that word ascending. From the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees. Till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the servants. Because we want to get a little bit of a picture and try to understand who these guys are, right? So there's 144,000 of these servants, right? You read it. We read it earlier. So who are these 144,000? Who, you know, I, I, I asked some questions. Who are they? Where did they come from? Where are they? Because there's a lot of differing opinions out there on who these guys are. When all of this is taking place, okay, I'll just say this. Many people believe that these are 144,000 Jewish or Israelite servants that are going to be on the earth whenever this is all taking place and everything's going down. Like they're just living on the earth, right? Okay, have you ever, have you ever even taken the time to consider it? I don't know if you have or not, but I've tried to think about it quite a bit. Maybe it's because I'm the pastor. But these are the questions that I ask. Who are they? Okay, so so number one, this is who they are. Look, he, it, it's I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there was sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. It actually goes on to say 12,000 from each tribe, okay? And so who are they? they 12,000 come from Judah. 12,000 come from Reuben. 12,000 come from Gad. You know, I just happen to be reading in my reading, if y'all have been reading along with us, then in the book of Genesis, we just went through when these offspring were born, right? And I can tell you that there's differing accounts throughout, even in the book of Revelation, where certain of the tribes aren't mentioned. And the one that's meant, that's missing in here is, is um, Dan. The one that's missing in here is Dan specifically, um, and who takes his place as Joseph in this particular list, all right? So, and you have Asher, you have uh, Neph Nephthalim, Manassas, okay? Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulon, Joseph, and then Benjamin. Now, I can tell you that all of these men's names come from offspring of between Leah and Rachel and their handmaids. So all of these men right here are the offspring of Jacob. Okay? 
And so, um, the, and what we're seeing, what we're being told is, is that these 144,000 or 12,000 from each one of these tribes. Now, real quick, chronologically, you know, if we go backwards, you remember Jacob is the son of Isaac, right? And Isaac is the son of Abraham. And so I just want you to know that's where the name Israel came from. Many of you already know that, right? Jacob's name, he was, his, his first name that he was given by his parents was Jacob, which means deceit, kind of means deceiver. And then if you'll remember, he had that wrestling match with God. Y'all remember that way back in the Old Testament? What happened? The, the word of God says that God, that God could not prevail. Again, I always like got to throw this in there. I'm not preaching on this right now. But it's not that God couldn't overcome a human being physically. At least not, that's not what I believe. I believe it's because Jacob refused to surrender to the will and put himself under the hand of God. So what God did was he touched him in the, the King James says in the hollow of his hip. And from that day moving forward, he limped. So what that means is, is for you today as a modern Christian, is that if you and I are contending with the most high and we refuse to submit ourselves under the will and under the hand of God, you might, he, we might, I might get touched in the hollow of my hip. What does that look like? I, I don't really know what it looks like. Will it be a physical limp? I'm not trying to say that it'll be a physical limp. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you ever prayed a prayer where you said, Oh Lord, I want you. My heart is yours. I want to belong to you. I want to be your servant. And guess what? If the Lord contend with you, he will. He loves you enough. Listen, man, that's a, well, look, I'm just thinking about this right now. I didn't plan on talking about none of this. He will, like it says of the old shepherds, when there was a little lamb that would venture off and go his own way, you know what the good shepherd would do? He'd go over there and pow, he'd break that leg. Yes, he'd sir. break that leg on that little bitty yes. lamb, pow, and he'd put it over his shoulder and he'd carry it. Little lamb, let me mend your leg because you don't even know where to go right. You keep going off in the wrong direction. You keep going according to your own will, even though I got a better plan for you. So let me go ahead and just break your leg right here and let me carry you on my shoulders until you grow up a little bit and you get a little bit of wisdom and you trust me a little bit better. And then I'm going to be able to let you go and your little leg will be healed up and you'll be all ready to go. Amen. Amen. See, that's exactly what the Lord did. Isn't it amazing that Jacob was a shepherd? Isn't it amazing that God has this thing? All planned out, you know, and guess what happened? Whenever the Lord touched him in the hollow of his hip, he changed his name to Israel. I didn't mean to go off on preaching because I got a whole lot of slides I need to show you. But what I do want you to know is that's where the name Israel came from. The 12 tribes of Israel. Does that make sense? All right. So what I wanted you to see here was, did you, have you ever studied about the 12 tribes of Israel and whether or not the 12 tribes still exist today? Because I got to tell you that... This is a Jewish website. I, I Googled it last night and I screenshotted it on my iPad. So you see that up at the top, you may not be able to see it, but I'm going to tell you what it says. It's kind of like small writing, so I get it if you can't see it. But this right here says kabadchabad.org. Okay? And it's a, that's a Jewish word. And it says up here, inspiration, community, and family. It's written by somebody named Malki Janowski. Okay, so this is a Jewish website written by Jewish people. Ask Rabbi, God in us, over here to the right, Jewish identity. So this is a Jewish website is the point that I'm trying to make. This is what it says. How can I find out which Hebrew tribe I'm from? For the most part, tribal identities have been lost through the generations and the majority of Jews do not know which tribe they come from. Now, it goes on to say this. There are a number of people whose families have passed down their identity as Kohanim, priests or Levites, which means they descend from the tribe of Levi. We do know that some people know about the, who, that they come from the tribe of Levi because they're part of the Temple Institute. And we've heard all about the red heifer and how they're getting all that ready and everything like that. There are also a handful of non-Levite families who can trace their ancestry to a particular tribe, but these are few and far between. When the Messiah comes, we will all find out which tribes we are from. I believe that. But when is, when, when is, when are you going to find that out? Is, you, you know what I'm saying? There may be a differing end of opinion. I believe that one day when Jesus comes. And does God know whether or not there's 12,000 from Gad, 12,000 from Reuben, 12,000? Of course, God knows everything. But the point I'm trying to make right now is, is I'm just trying to give you my opinion on 
who I think the 144,000 are, and you may not completely agree with me when we're done, and that's okay, but I have thought it through. Who the 144,000 are, where were they before this happened, where are they whenever they're getting sealed, where did they come from, all right? And so I wanted you to see, though, as of right now, most Jewish people do not know if they claim to be Jew they, or Israelites, really. Let's just call them Israelites. Why were you making such a big deal? Okay, y'all know this, right? The kingdom was split in two. Y'all remember that? When was it split in two? When Solomon defied the Lord and he took foreign women and he wasn't supposed to and they drew his heart away and he built altars to Chemosh and Molech, right? False gods. And the judgment of God was that he split the kingdom in two. And there was 10 northern tribes, 10, two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And then the 10 got lost. When the Assyrian Empire took them over, the 10 northern tribes got lost. If you read the story, they mixed a bunch of people. That's where the Samaritans came from. Anyway, ever since then, people don't really know what tribe they're from. So I wanted you to see that. I was just trying to make a point. Where did they come from, these 144,000? Okay, are they from the past? Are they from the present? Are they dead? Were, in other words, were they dead? Um, these are just some questions I had. Are the, were they alive when all this happened? Were they raptured? Were they already dead? I can tell you that some people's opinion is that there's going to be more than one rapture. Some people's opinion is that they will be raptured. Some people's opinion is that they're actually raptured in Revelation chapter 12 and that they're the man child connected to the rod that we will study in further detail when we get to that. I just mentioned it in passing and, 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 and so that there's going to be multiple raptures. Okay. I personally don't, don't see it that way. Where, where are they? All right. So I believe they are in heaven at the time that they're being sealed. And I'm going to explain to you why I believe that. All right. Here's the scripture. Why I believe that you see it. And I saw another angel. Well, Ascending. You see that word right there? Ascending. Oh, Lord. I didn't mean to do that. I don't guess I'm going to be able to go back. Oh, here we go. This is the problem with technology. Okay? When you can't control your technology, <coughs> and instead it controls you. All right, where are they? I said I believe that they're in heaven. Right? I believe they're in heaven. All right, look, I wanted you to see this word right here. You see that? Ascending. Ascending from the east. So this angel, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So why are you spending so much time talking about ascending? Because this angel has the seal of the living God in his hand, and he's going to seal the 144,000, and he's ascending with the seal in his hand. He's not descending with the seal in his hand. To me, that matters. All right? I do believe they were raptured. We're going to get to that. I believe that they are Old Testament saints that died, and now they have their glorified bodies after the rapture. And this is part of the scriptural precedence I'm going to use to make this point. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and what? The dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, you do need to understand something here. Because, look, there's false teachings out there that say, yeah, but, but I'm trying to tell you, I believe that they're Old Testament saints. So how are they dead in Christ? I'm not telling you how they're dead in Christ, my friend. Because Old Testament believers were saved, contrary to some popular opinion, Old Testament saints were saved the same way New Testament saints are saved. What are you saying? They put their faith, in the blood of the Lamb. They put their faith in the coming Messiah. He wasn't here yet. But look, do I have to go through it again? Well, let's go through it again. He's the seed of the woman. He's the seed of Abraham. He's the seed of Judah. He's the seed of David. He is 
the word that became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He is the one that John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But before he was manifest as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, there was a Lamb moving backwards that took away the sin of the nation on the Day of Atonement in the book of Leviticus. There was Before that, there was a Lamb that took away the sin of a family at the Passover. And before that, there was a Lamb that took away the sin of the first couple that fell into sin, Adam and Eve, because God said, your fig leaves aren't going to work. I got to clothe you with the skins of an innocent animal. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say it's been the same plan from the beginning of time. Amen. God knew before Adam ever fell that Adam was going to fall. And that's why Peter wrote to us in 1 Peter 1.18. And he said, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of a lamb, which was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. They were saved looking forward to Messiah. We are saved looking backward to Messiah. Does that make sense? They were saved in the future that Jesus was going to come. But look, once he came and once the rapture happens, all of those that are asleep in the Lord are coming up out the ground. We who are alive and remain will not precede those that have already died. Amen. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that the scene in chapter 7 between the seal number 6 and seal number 7 is in heaven and that these Old Testament saints who were dead preceded the great multitude that we saw that were dressed in white clothes and robes and were giving worship to the Lamb. They were already there. They, they beat them by a split second is what I'm trying to say. That's the position out there. All right. It says, and I look now, I'm moving up to, I'm, I'm look at this, I'm shifting gears on you and I'm going to Revelation 14, 1, because I want you to see that there's some common things in Revelation 14 connected to Revelation 7. It talks about, it talks about these 144,000 in Revelation 14 also. But I want to, I want to, listen, we're going to, when we get to Revelation 14, we're going to break it down again, but I want to at least introduce this thought to you, Okay. It's, it's, I believe that Revelation 14 is actually repeating, and, and I got some more slides to make the point, is repeating what's already taking place in Revelation 7. In other words, when we're going to read Revelation 14, I don't believe that we're necessarily further in time. I believe it's the same scene, but it's just looking at it from a different angle. So what I'm saying is, is that in Revelation 14, and, I'm gonna, and I got a couple of slides to make my point, we're still back at where we were at Revelation 7. This is after tribulation, the rapture is going to take place. Re Revelation 14 talks about the rapture again, I believe. You may not agree with me, but I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Talks about the rapture again, and then the wrath takes place in Revelation 15. And when we get to the vials and the trumpets, I'm going to... Try to show you how they connect with one another. Okay? Okay. But going back to Revelation 7, we had tribulation, rapture, wrath is coming. Revelation 14, we have tribulation, rapture, wrath is coming. All right? So I want you to see that. But it said, but it said right there, it said, behold. All right. I think I just figured out how to work this thing. All right. Look. I look. And lo, a lamb stood on the mount, Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, I don't think that's me. Is that one of y'all? Let me make sure. I don't think that's me. All right. So, I look. So, listen, I want you to know that there was a Mount Zion in Jerusalem. There was a Mount Zion in Jerusalem, right? But in the book of Hebrews, it talks about a heavenly Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Did y'all know that? In the book of Hebrews, the point I'm trying to make is, the book of Hebrews, there is a heavenly Mount Zion. This right here is the heavenly Mount Zion. John the Revelator says, I looked and there was a lamb. He's talking about Jesus. Obviously, he stood on the mount, I could say on the mount, the heavenly Zion, and with them were 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. So obviously at this point in the scene, they already have the seal that's placed, all right? 
These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. So it's just giving us a little bit more information about the 144,000. It says right here, they weren't defiled with women, they were virgins. A lot of people believe that that means that these men, these 144,000 that were made up of 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes that we listed a while ago, never had relations with a woman, okay, physically. I, per I personally... I, I can't prove it. I personally, that's not how I think. I think that this is spiritual. Okay, and that's my opinion, and I can't prove it. Why? Because if a man is married, then it's not wrong for him to touch a woman. Okay, that's one of my reasons. But also, one of my main reasons is, and again, I can't prove it to you. I'm just telling you my opinion. Uh, one of my main reasons is how I've talked to you before about the spirit of harlotry. You remember that? The spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of harlotry, the spirit of mystery Babylon how she shows up in Revelation 17 and 18, how Dan isn't mentioned in the 12 tribes, and he, it was well known that Dan was a tribe of idolatry, and I believe that this is, that's what this is really saying, that they were like the heart of David. What did God say about David? He's a man after my own heart. Why was David a man after your own heart? God, he committed adultery and premeditated murder, because he never lifted up his heart to an idol. David never worshipped false gods. David's heart was connected to the Lord, and he only wanted to live for God. All right? That's what I believe that this is talking about. I believe that these are 144,000 Old Testament saints that died, were raptured, have a seal in their forehead, and that they never committed spiritual adultery on the Lord. That's, again, I can't prove it, but nobody else can prove it the other way either. All right. So that's that's kind of my position. And you don't have to you don't have to completely agree with me. And that's fine. But what I did want you to see with this verse of scripture right here was this, because you see, you got to kind of do something with this word, this redeemed word. Right. Because it means that they were the word redeemed right there means to be purchased. But it also in the context means that they were taken from the earth. Right? They were taken from the earth. So it works with what I was trying to say that these 144,000 were Old Testament saints that died. They were buried, but yet they, in the rapture, they were redeemed from the earth. You get what I'm saying? I, I wanted you to see that. And look, they were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now, listen, I don't, I don't really have, I got to be careful. I don't really have time to say all of this. And I really didn't even plan to say it. But if you go back to Leviticus 23, I've done a lot of teaching on the feasts of the Lord before. All right. And in the feast of the Lord, it talks about the feast of first fruits. Now, I'm kind of slowing down a little bit because I'm still amazed every time I talk about it. That the first feast was a week of unleavened bread that started with Passover. Y'all remember that? So what was Passover? The killing of an innocent lamb. So that Israel could be saved. And then after that, there was a week of unleavened bread. Meaning you couldn't have any yeast in your house. Yeast is a type of sin. Jesus fulfilled both of those first two feasts. Now all this is happening within a week. These first three feasts. Okay. The, the feast, the, Jesus was crucified on Passover. I don't know if you knew that or not. But Jesus was crucified on Passover. And the word of God says that he, it talks about the fact that he, it, he was without sin. So he was the unleavened bread, right? And the Bible says that he, Jesus even said that of himself. He told, he told, the, the, he said, I can't remember exactly who he was talking to, but he said, your father did not, Moses didn't give you that bread. My father in heaven gave you that bread, for I am the bread of life that comes down from heaven. So Jesus is the bread of life. He's the unleavened bread. He's the one that's without sin. He fulfills Passover. He fulfills unleavened bread. He and and listen, you know what first fruits is? First fruits is the is the first part of the harvest. And I, I remember doing a study about it. And what would happen is the priest would go out there in the barley. He'd grab him a handful of, of barley. He'd cut it with the sickle. And he'd wave it up at the Lord. It was the feast of first fruits. And you know when it happened? The first Sunday after the Passover. What? Stop the presses, dude. Really? Yes. Thousand... 2,000 years before Jesus was born, what happened was Jesus was the Passover lamb that died on Passover. And then on the first Sunday after the Passover, what happened? He resurrected from the dead. He was the first fruits 
unto God. He was the first one to be resurrected from the dead. And then 50 days after that, what happened? Pente, Pentecost. The day of Pentecost happened. Exactly again, 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, the disciples are in the upper room and the Holy Spirit falls on them and they begin to speak. It doesn't get any better than this. The only way it gets any better is that the last three have not been fulfilled yet. We don't even have time to touch them. All right, so the point that I'm trying to make is, is that they were redeemed from among men and that the word redeemed is fulfilled in the fact that they were Old Testament saints and died and that they were brought up from this earth. And listen, it's even better because they were the first fruits of the rapture because they were part of the dead that it said in the last scripture we talked about that though that we who are alive and remain will not precede them that are dead in the Lord. Amen? So I just wanted you to see that. I want you to know that I'm thinking this stuff through. All right? So where's the scriptural precedence for this, though? Because, see, if I was you sitting in there and I was being introduced to some new information that I had never heard before, I'd be asking, hold on a second, buddy. You got some scripture to back this up? The thought of people that were dead from the Old Testament being brought back to life? And then being put on the earth to witness for the Lord. Yes, I do. Look right here. Let Revelation 11, 3. Look at this. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. What is that talking about? Now, can I prove what I'm about to say? No, I cannot. But I'm about to ask somebody to help me out. Help the preacher out. Who do people say that these two witnesses are? Okay. Elijah and Enoch. So, and, and, and who else do they say? Elijah, Elijah, Moses. Elijah and Moses. And there's various reasons why. Right? Okay. We, I didn't mean to get into this, but look, Hannah said it. Jessica said it. The two that they had in common were Elijah. Because if you study these two witnesses, one, one of them calls down fire from heaven. Okay? What did Elijah do? He called down fire from heaven. One of them it's, it talks about releasing the plagues. What happened with Moses? He released the plagues. And if you look at the two, they correlate very much. In addition to Elijah and Enoch, they have something else in common. What do they have in common? They never died. That's exactly right. They were taken up to the Lord. Amen. The Bible says that, even, that Elijah was caught up in a whirlwind. Amen. And his mantle fell to the ground and Elisha picked it up. What does it say about Enoch? Enoch was and then he walked with God. So neither one of those men died. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And so that's the idea on why it could have been Enoch. And Elijah. And so why would some people say Moses? Because it seems like what the other witness does is more consistent with Moses' ministry. But what about the body? It doesn't make sense because Moses would have died. Well, there's a scripture that's really interesting in the book, letter written to, uh, from Jude. And you know what it says? It says that Satan and the archangel Michael contended over the body of Moses. Did you know in the Old Testament that it actually says that God himself buried Moses? And so, for whatever reason, Satan wanted that body. I don't know what to tell you. But that's the reasoning behind something weird going on with the body of Moses. And God said, no, you don't make the rules. I make the rules. And so I'm just letting you know that that's the thought. So they, they said it. I didn't even have to say it. Most people believe that these two witnesses will be Old Testament Believers and like I think Hannah's main reasoning is is that the reason Enoch instead of Moses is because Enoch never died and that is a good thought yeah. But the other concept is that it could be Moses and so that would have been to clarify That would have that if it was Enoch and Elijah then really and truly my whole point wouldn't have been made because neither one of them died but because I believe that it could be Moses that is the point but Old Testament passage right that shows people in the, uh, the the concept of old testament believers that died and that would go into the rapture because again this picture in heaven i'm saying is in heaven and that they're being sealed so i do believe that that certainly could be the uh the picture but chapter 14 has more in common with chapter 7 than just the 144,000. i want you to see these scriptures we're going to move through them kind of quickly but i want you to see it, it says look 
I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man. So who do, if you had to guess, just go ahead and shout it out there. Throw it out Jesus. there. Jesus. Bridget said it. She wins. <laughs> Son of Man. Jesus. I mean, that, when I see that, I mean, yeah, I know I put it in red. I wasn't trying to trick you. I wasn't trying to make you answer right. But I put, you know, I, I figured y'all would say that. Son of Man. Jesus. And he had on his hand a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. So when we go through this, I'm going to keep asking you questions. So we already, I don't know if you all agree, but we already determined that we believe this could, this is Jesus, right? Right? We all cool with that? All right. And he has a sickle in his hand. And look, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and ask somebody to go out on a limb here. What do you think that means, that part that I have in red, the harvest of the earth is ripe? If you don't want to shout it out yet, that's fine. But I want you to make a mental note in your mind on what you think it would have been. Okay, and then we'll just keep moving forward. All right, so here we go. So, so you got the Son of Man. He's on a cloud. He's got a golden crown, and he's got a sickle in his hand. And an angel comes out and says, "Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe." All right, here we go. You ready? And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So, what do you? Again, I'm not asking you to shout it out yet. Just hold on to your thought. What does it mean that the Son of Man with a crown and a sickle reaped the earth? All right. So let's get, now, now look. Let's keep going. Look, another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. So here's another one. So we had the Son of Man with a golden crown. He had a sharp sickle, and it said, "Thrust in your sickle." And reap the earth because the harvest of the earth. And what I'm trying to tell you is that this is two different events. Two different people. Two different events. I'm just trying to tell you. They both got a sickle. They're both thrusting the sickle into the earth. But it's not the same thing that they're reaping. Alright. And I'm about to show you. Here we go. Here's the difference. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire. And cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle saying... Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So, we've got a lot of veiled language here. It's a lot of symbolic language. So, we have two different people with two different sickles producing two different, reaping two different harvests. One of them is a harvest of the earth. And the other one is a harvest of the clusters of the vine of the earth. I don't know about you, but I mean, the first time I read this, like it really like, I was like, wow, something's up with this. So, so when you, if you were walking in a vineyard and you saw a vine connected to the dirt of the ground and you saw these grapes, I mean, you'd call this the fruit, the fruit of the earth, right? Now, I will tell you this, that I have preached it many a time. Of the, of the common theme or motif, if you will, that's running from one end of the Bible to the other. It's seed time and harvest, my friend. I mean, seed time and harvest, as long as there is day and night, and, and, and you know, there will be seed time and harvest. What about the parable of the seed? The, the sower went out to sow, right? And what about the, the, the oh, and, and you know, the good man, he sowed good seed, and then the enemy came in behind him, and he sowed tear and what about uh and and he will he will make the harvest and he will winnow the grain and and basically the grain will go into the storage house and the chaff will be burned up over and over again the theme of harvest runs throughout the scriptures of the bible so here we should not expect anything different in the end there's discussion of a harvest so I'm just trying to tell you that I personally, I'm, no, I don't think I personally believe, I think it's pretty clear that this is two different entities, two different sickles, and two different harvests. And I've asked you to try to determine in your own mind, and I'll tell you what I believe it is as we move forward. Look, harvest of the earth versus 
a harvest of the clusters of the vine of the earth. Okay? So here we go. Revelation 14, 19. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth. Now look, we're told right here. We're told right here what the second harvest is. No more guessing game. The word of the Lord has, has solved the riddle for us. There you go. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And so what we see here is that the second angel with the sickle that performed a harvest, what he did with his harvest was he threw, threw it into the wine press. <laughs> he threw it into the wine press of the wrath of God. Okay, so now knowing that, think backwards, and what would you propose that the first harvest was? Rapture. Rapture. Thank you. That's all I want. <laughs> all, right. all right, repetition. Chapter 14 repeats the scene of chapter 7, a reference to the 144,000 and the rapture. We will cover more closely that the vials and the trumpets, I believe, are happening together. But for now, I want you to see that it is being explained all over again. Tribulation, rapture, wrath. All right? Look at this. Here's a, here's a picture. Chapter 13, tribulation. Now, what is chapter 13? This is, this is my take on this. Chapter 13 is whenever the beast or the antichrist rises up, the false prophet rises up, and we're told that they too will demand that people take a mark in their hand, or on their head, and without which no man may buy or sell, and he will cause the whole world to have to worship the first beast, and anybody that does not will be killed. If that don't sound like tribulation, but not the wrath of God, I don't know what it sounds like, all right? So we're going to separate that because chapter 14, like I just read to you, shows the rapture. I mean, I think we all agreed on that. And then whenever we get to chapter 16 and 17, the wrath of the trumpet of the vials is being poured out, okay? And so in chapter 6, tribulation, the seals. Seal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then 6 marks the day of the Lord. Chapter 6, tribulation. Chapter 7, rapture. The scene in heaven with the 144,000 and then the great multitude. And chapter 8, wrath. Again, showing a connection between the two. That's the point that I'm trying to make here. All right, back to the scene in chapter 7 after the 144,000. Revelation 7, 9, and 10. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And he goes on to say, who are they? They came out of great tribulation. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord God. Lord, your word reveals your heart to us. Lord, it reveals this beautiful plan that you've given mankind. Lord, I'm just grateful tonight, even when we started tonight in prayer. You put it on my heart to be grateful, Lord, that I'm even saved tonight. To be grateful that you did, you came to live on the inside of my heart. And to be grateful, Lord, that you have given me a desire to serve you. And Lord, I started this night by praying for people that have been in the walls of this church and maybe even people that are here tonight or people that are watching on video that find themselves in the midst of a struggle, Lord. Deep in their heart, they want to serve you. Deep in their heart, they love you. But they cannot seem to find the strength that they need in order to serve you the way that they know that you've called them to. And so, Lord, we plead with you tonight. We call upon your name. We thank you, Jesus, for dying in obedience to set us free. We thank you, Lord, that you said it is finished, Lord, that it's a completed work. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move in the midst of our hearts and in our lives, in the lives of the people that you have called us to minister to, Lord. 
We pray that you would give us the victory, Lord, for your word says we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God.